Hi, everyone. Welcome to the final session of this final plenary of this fantastic conference. Um, you should all win a prize for being here at the last plenary, so well done. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge country, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people. Uh, acknowledge that that land has never been ceded and never will be ceded. I'd like to acknowledge the contribution that Ngunnawal people make to the culture of Canberra and the ACT in this region and pay my respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here today. Um, some great keynotes today uh, in this final plenary. And the first one is from Mindy Woods, who's a proud Bunjalong Wijabul Wiyabu woman who followed her dreams of opening her own restaurant in, in, on ancestral country, fueled by a desire to create opportunities for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to connect with Aboriginal culture and art and stories through food a desire to return to country and reconnect with family and culture in mid-2020, saw so Mindy made the, make the brave move to open her own very own native-inspired restaurant, Karkala, in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Actually, probably just the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mindy, I don't want to depress, depress Mindy at this point. Um, it, Mindy's bravery, resilience, and commitment to a greater goal has seen her achieve top five indigenous experiences in Byron Bay, Mentions in Delicious Magazine, the Sydney Morning Herald, and the Daily Telegraph. Please welcome Mindy. Mindy. Jingila, Jingiwala, how are you fellas today? Oh, lots of energy. I'm surprised. I thought you, after that food coming, you guys would all be like sinking into your seats. And I saw some people eating popcorn before. I thought, my goodness, maybe I'm here to put on a blockbuster to keep you guys organised and, and, and awake. But isn't it great that we're all together again? It is such a relief for us to be out and about and being able to connect again. And I think that's a big part of what we've missed out on in the last couple of years is just that sense of connection. And for me, connection is so important. So, Bugle Bear Yahweh, thank you so much for having me. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and I acknowledge and respect their connection to the land, skies and seas and waters and that connection is timeless. You know, I'm very fortunate to be a First Nations woman and I hold that with great pride and, and with great responsibility also. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about Australian native food and what I see to be its importance in, in connection, in country, and of course, enjoyment, because if you don't love to cook, you at least hopefully love to eat. And that's what I love about native food. It's a great connector. Isn't food a connector? You know, you think of, you know, the times that we get together, we celebrate or we're commiserating. Food is always a, a source of, you know, something that brings us together. Thank you. And for me, native food can be just that, bringing us together to connect with First Nations culture in a way that we've never really thought of, you know, thought of doing before. So let's get stuck into it. Our beautiful country. These are all the First Nations communities around Australia. And I'm very proud to be a Bundjalung woman from Wijibal Waiabal. So our boundaries extend from Oh, actually, I'll show you. This is actually my ancestral grandmother here. This is Mary Capine sitting on the banks of the Richmond River. Around the 1860s, this was actually taken. And this is one of my ancestral um, uncles, Nettie Larkin. And I'm so, so fortunate to have these photos and to be able to trace my family line because, my God, it gives me a sense of purpose and belonging here. And I hope that all Australians, whether you're a new Australian, you're, you're non-Indigenous, Indigenous, you have a sense of belonging to this country because I truly believe this is the, the greatest country on earth. We're so blessed in so many ways and we all deserve a feeling of connectedness to it. And connectedness often comes coming from a sense of pride. And I want you all to feel proud to be Australian because I certainly am. So my great, 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 great grandmother here Mary Capine. She was married to King Jack Capine, who was king of the Widjibal Waibul clan and chief of the Arakwal tribe um, in the Bundjalung region. And the Bundjalung region, it basically goes from the top of, up through Queensland it goes, up to the Logan River at the, at the north, 
It goes right down to Yamba, the Lower Clarence River, down in Yamba. So we've got really prime real estate, <laughs> Bunjalung Mob. We go out to the McPherson Ranges in the, in the west, and then, of course, that beautiful Pacific coastline. This is where I call home. Cabin Bar, Byron Bay. How lucky am I, hey? So that's where I've come from today. Byron Bay, its traditional name is Cabin Bar, which means meeting place. And in, it was a place traditionally where our people congregated, held ceremony, we hunted, they foraged, they held cer ceremony, shared knowledge, connected. And that has been happening for thousands of years. We have evidence just from archaeological research done in that area, that our ancestors have been there for over 20,000 years. There's pippies there, there's middens there, the bush kitchens, full of the bones of, of redneck wallabies and paddy melons and pippies and oyster shells that date back to 20,000 years. Tools that were recovered, that were hunting tools, that were cooking tools, that are still in this place to this very day. So as much as we love Byron Bay to be this hip, trendy kind of tourist town at the moment, it has a richness, a history that I hope you guys can also connect with. I am also a native food chef and restaurateur. And nothing lights up my heart and my belly more than native food, I've got to tell you. I get so excited about it because little do Aussies realise that we have six and a half foods that are purely unique to Australia. Six and a half thousand beautiful foods. I mean, you think of native food, you think of bush tucker, and you think of witchy grubs and kangaroo. I'm sure of it. I mean, that's what everyone says to me. So what are you cooking in your restaurant? Witchy grubs and kangaroo. And of course I'm not. I definitely serve kangaroo. My uncles always ha hassle me to put witchy grubs on the menu, but I'm not sure that I'll be able to sell them to my customers, even though I know I'd get my family in to, to eat them. The family just doesn't pay. That's a problem. So... <laughs> But what I love to do is connect people with these beautiful foods because to truly understand a culture and a country, you must experience its foods. You think of when we travel, and we're great travellers, aren't we, Australians? We travel the world, and what do we go travelling for? For the beautiful views, the landscapes, the history, and, of course, the food. You think of the pizzas, the pastas of Italy, the French champagne and the beautiful cheeses we fail to recognise that we have a food culture existing right here. And in fact, it's the oldest food culture in the world. You know, it goes back some 65,000 years, and in that way, we are host to the world's oldest foods on Earth, which is absolutely incredible. These foods aren't propagated and cultivated the way that these normal crops are these days. They grow wild. They're starting to get to the point, there's about 20 of them at the moment that are getting into kind of a commercial viability state. Um, but for the most part, we are harvesting and sourcing these in their natural intended state. And what a lot of people don't realise, as just as diverse as our geography is across Australia, just as diverse is our food. I'm a rainforest woman. You know, as a Bundjalung woman, I'm a protector of the waters. I'm a freshwater and a saltwater woman. So my priorities and my responsibilities are to protect the waters and what grows into them. And as a First Nations woman, our role also is to look after the food and country. And I take that responsibility, you know, <laughs> greatly. I can't even tell you. It comes before everything that I do in my life. My first priority is I need to make sure that I'm taking care of country because I want to be a good ancestor for the future generations. My first experience of native food was when I was a little girl. You know, I was, oh, I'll flick forward. I'm going to go all over the place. I don't usually use PowerPoints, you can probably tell. I did it today because I knew that we were in a presentation theatre, but I don't usually use them because I'm usually good at just talking off the cuff. But why native foods? For environment, for reconciliation, to connect us together, but also for our health of our Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities, but also because we love to eat. It tastes good. It's part of like celebrating what true Australian cuisine is all about, and that's what we're going to share today. So food has a history, a culture, a story, a relationship, an identity. And just as I mentioned before, just think of how diverse our country is. We've got a huge country. It is diverse in its landscapes, just as it is in its cultures, and we can't just whitewash what this is all about. I recently was in Arante country, right in the heart of Australia, and it looks like a heart shape, central desert country. And the food and the culture there is so completely different from my culture on the eastern coastline. But going there, our connections are so similar. Our priority is to look after our mob, our country, and make sure it's there for future generations. 
but the food landscapes of that country is so different. I can't source the foods that are in Orante country, country compared to the foods that are in Bundjalung country. And it's really interesting because we think of the different geographical indicators, even when it comes to wine. I'm sure you guys love to drink wine. Think of Australia just as that. We've got rainforest food, we've got subtropical food, we've got you know the beautiful desert region food, and there's just an absolute plethora of flavours, textures and foods that we can all be exploring. So my first experience of food was with this beautiful woman here, my nan, Margie Felton. And she, she was a very wonderful and powerful woman. She was born on Cabbage Tree Island, uh, Aboriginal mission. She was allowed to leave because she married a white fella, my grandfather, Oswald Felton, so she was allowed to leave the mission. She went on a good Catholic woman to have 11 children. 11 children in a three-bedroom home, and then she raised six more of her nieces and nephews. So can you imagine that? 17 kids in a three-bedroom home. My pop was in the army, so he'd often go away and leave Nan with the kids and with very little money to spend, trying to feed 17 kids. So my Nan went back to her traditional ways. She would get out on country, she would forage, she would go mud crabbing, pipying, she would go oyster foraging, she would go out and pick all the beautiful native succulents that were on the coastline, and my mum was raised on that food. My mum can't stand to eat mud crab to this day because she grew up on it so much. Like, what a problem to have. But this is where my connection and my love of native food came about. Because my nan taught me how to connect with country, and I didn't even realise it at the time. I thought she was just trying to wear me out because I had so much energy. But to get out there and be on country and how to respect it. How to get out there and take what was available at the time and only take what you need and nothing more. How to take what was in season and not a typical season that we are used to, that calendar season that we you know, apply to our, our lives as Westerners. We had a cultural calendar, which is actually made up of six seasons, and that was dictated to what was going on around us. We looked up into the skies, the sands, the seas. We had to look around to observe what was happening in the environment to actually know what season we were in. And we're actually going into um, a Banksia season at the moment, Banksia season, which was, we knew when the Banksias was coming out, the mullets were migrating. We knew that when there was grubs on the coastal wattle seed, that that was also an indication of the mullets were migrating. So guess what mob was eating on at that time? <laughs> Lots of mullet. And, and it's one of, those, one of those things that over the years, I just realised it wasn't just about getting food and sitting on the beach and getting together as a mob and, you know, having a good time at Christmas together. Nan was actually connecting us with country. And it was such an important sense of belongingness and connection, not only as a family, but to that land and that country, the waters and the seas, that I really hold close to my heart today. And I think if everybody had an experience like that, we would not only appreciate our culture and our connection to this country so much more, I'm talking everybody, but we would have a great deal more motivation to protect it for the future. You know, convenience food is great, and of course, we as modern people go to those convenience foods. But just have a think for a moment what it would be like if we had to eat according to the seasons and calendar. I mean, it's actually a lot of joy in it. When the tomatoes are the ripest and they're at their best, just as the oysters are at their ripest and they're at their best, that's when they're at their most nutritionally valued and, and dense. That's when they taste the best, which is even better. But then we move on to the next. This is eating and moving in rhythms with the earth, you know? And it's not just about what we can take from the earth and the country. Food was a way that we formed a relationship with country. And that's what I love about First Nations knowledge. And I think to move forward, you know, when you think about food security going into 2050, they're predicting we're not going to have enough food for our population based on the agricultural practices we currently have. How about we look back so we can learn and then hopefully move forward together? So why grow native food? Do any of you fellows grow native food at home? Does anyone have native food in their garden? You probably have it. I'm happy to see a couple of hands going up. Guys, it grows absolutely everywhere. My partner freaks out. I walk down the street and I bend over on the sidewalk and I start picking stuff up. I see personally I see these things. There is native foods growing all around us everywhere and they grow here for a reason. 
they require little watering, they don't need any fertilizers, they're naturally pest resistant, they grow, you know, they attract the birds, the bees, and what we say in Bundjalung country, they attract the Bundjalung in too, but it is, they grow here for a reason, and that's what we've got to start realizing. A lot of the introduced crops and stuff, they weren't intended to grow here, and we found ways of managing them, but irrigation, farming, and things like that are really taking its toll. So why don't we go back to some of the stuff that originally grows here? It's, it's here because it's adapted to the environment, it works with it, it grows in terrible conditions, <laughs> I don't know how it survives half the time, but it's also full of nutrition for us. So I've got some of my beautiful favourite natives up here, and I cook with these at my restaurant, and I take them, I guess, you know, we, we say ancient ingredients but modern flavours. I try and bring these ingredients, because I think they're world-class cuisine, into the modern day, because we are modern people. I had one woman come into my um, restaurant the other day, and she said, I don't think you're doing a very good job of representing First Nations culture. And I said, oh, why do you think that is? She said, well, you're playing pop mu music. I don't, see, I don't see you have, you know, um, you know like snake and, and all these things on, on the menu. And she said, and why on earth are you, you cooking a curry? And I said, well, isn't that funny? I said, the first thing that I learned how to cook with my uncles down on the beach was a pippy curry. And she said, what? I said, it was the first thing I learned how to cook. Got the pippies out of the water. We went and picked curry myrtle, which is a thing, curry myrtle. We threw it in the pot, salt water and a splash of cream, and we cooked a pippy curry. So I think, you know, breaking down a lot of the stereotypes and barriers around what people conceive to be First Nations is a really important thing, and food is a powerful vessel of that. Who's seen this beautiful plant before, saltbush? Oh, you guys are rural, rural doctors, aren't you, and rural practitioners. You must have seen saltbush around. This is a magical, wonderful plant. And the thing about our native foods as well is they weren't just foods. Most of them had a cultural use as well. So they were medicines. We use them in, for crafts and arts, um, and we use them to help the environment. So saltbush is one of my favourites because it's absolutely delicious. It grows prolifically. Farmers got onto it a few years ago and started feeding it to their cattle. You've probably heard of saltbush lamb. But this stuff is absolutely incredible. Our old people used to use this as a medicine. They would grind it up and use it on, as a pulses on, on wounds and things like that. But it's also a fire retardant. So what our old people did when they knew that the fire season was coming through is that they used to make sure that this was planted ahead of time to stop the spread of bushfire. Isn't that incredible? And of course, it's prolific down through Victoria and South Australia, where our bushfires really took its toll a few years ago. But isn't that something that we could learn in terms of farm and, and land management practices, looking back to old ways that don't cost much money at all, making sure we've got this beautiful plant growing around as a fire break for bushfires. Absolutely incredible stuff. It's absolutely delicious. It takes on the flavour of the environment, which is great. It actually helps with desalination of soils. And with irrigation farming, we've got a big problem with, um, with salt and salinity. So this is an absolutely magical plant. At Kakala, what we do is we deep fry it, we serve it on the branch, we serve it tempura style, and we let everyone break off those beautiful little leaves and eat them um, like a little chip, a little native chip, dip them in a bush tomato sauce and a squeeze of lemon juice, and it's absolutely delicious. But this stuff will grow just about anywhere, all down the eastern coastline, it will, won't, and the beautiful thing about this, you can neglect it. You can neglect it, and it doesn't need much care or love at all, which is beautiful. On to another one. You guys must know about this lemon myrtle. We think of this as an antiseptic or something like that, but there is so much more to lemon myrtle than just lemon myrtle. It's got the highest citral rate of any food in the world, which is like lemonier than lemon. It's got that beautiful lemon kind of scent and flavour, and I can smell it before I see it, often walking through the bush in the rainforest down by home. Our literal um, rainforest along the coastline of Australia, down the eastern coast of Australia, 75% of those plants had a cultural use. Isn't that incredible to think of that knowledge base? 75% of those plants had a cultural use. So the cottonwood tree, for instance, if you've seen that beautiful coastal hibiscus flower that grows all along the eastern coastline, it had four to five cultural uses. Isn't that amazing? So it was edible, the flowers are edible, so they were used as food. The bark was stripped back and it was really sappy bark, um, that a little like a, 
I guess it's a, a waxy kind of substance that comes out of just under the bark. That was actually used as an antiseptic. And then what our old people used to do is strip the bark down and actually make it into a twine or string. Some of the fishing nets that were found in our area were up to 100 metres long and have lasted for, for decades. I mean, these are amazing resources that even we could look at in the modern day. Instead of pulling nylon in our seas for fishing nets and fishing line, why aren't we looking for things like that? It's just as strong. So back to lemon myrtle, I absolutely love this. It's an absolutely beautiful plant. We call it dalalang in our, our language, and it grows prolifically. The beautiful thing about the lemon myrtle is that it's, an actu it's a pest resistor. So if you want to have a garden and you want to make sure that you don't have too many pests and bugs around, plant this around your garden. And that's what a lot of our old people knew as well. When they wanted the Davidson plums to be growing up big, they used to plant lemon myrtle and um, anise myrtle around them to stop the, the bugs getting to them. Because they had to make sure that there was enough for everyone, so they'd plant these around to make sure there was enough for the bunjalung, there was enough for the birds and the beautiful creatures that love to eat them, but this would actually keep most of it away. It was used in smoking ceremonies, it was used as an inhalant, um, there were so many uses for these beautiful things and of course we enjoy it today in beautiful teas, in body creams. We make a beautiful lemon myrtle oil out of it at work and we serve it on our, on our, um, on our salads and use it as a dressing. But this is the kind of stuff that we should all be embracing at home, even in our own kitchens. I really want to get these beautiful native foods out of the kitchens of these flash restaurants and into your homes. You know, this is where it's at. If we start to introduce some of these beautiful things, even into our home gardens, we're increasing biodiversity, we're welcoming in the wildlife, we're not going to have to use those pesticides and those fertilisers that we've become so accustomed to using. And of course, they are a flavour bomb. And I think the reason that we're becoming so successful at Kakala is not necessarily how good a cook I am, <laughs> because I'm not a trained chef, but I think it's the powerful flavours of this food, and they're so unique in their flavour profiles. When people come in to experience it, they have these life-changing moments. They think, wow, what is that that I'm tasting? People don't realise we have things like our own native ginger. Did you fellows know that we had our own native ginger? I mean, we love ginger, right? Gingers are wonderful for so many different things, and I love Southeast Asian cooking, so I use a lot of ginger, but our own native ginger, and this was a cultural tool too, the entire plant was edible, is edible. So the rhizome is very much like a, it's like a mild kind of galangal kind of flavour, um, but the rhizome is obviously edible. But then the leaves were used for wrapping up food and cooking in them. They impart a beautiful flavour into food as well. And then the berries were eaten. The seeds were spat out, and they were actually used as geographical markers for walking tracks. What that meant is that our old people were putting the seeds back into country, they are marking their walking trails, and they were making sure that there was food along the way. It's so clever when you look, look back and think about how clever our people were. So native ginger is absolutely one of my favourites, and it's super versatile and easy to use. Just like you would with any ginger, it's a beautiful, beautiful plant to use. And, I mean, if you start to grow it, watch out, because it does take over like a weed. This one, super close to my heart. Who's seen this growing around the eastern coastline of Australia? It's gorgeous. What do you fellas call it? Pig face. It's a terrible name for it, isn't it? Where does that even come from? I'm really, I had no idea where that name comes from. But this, and they say that because the fruit resembles a pig's face. I, I struggle to see it. Maybe I'm not creative enough to see that in that picture up there. I do not see a pig's face at all. But anyway, pig face, Kakala. This was actually the first succulent that my nan taught me how to pick. And that's why I named my restaurant after it. It used to grow prolifically around where we lived. And even now, with the kind of the erosion of the beaches, we don't see it too much. And it's absolutely heartbreaking. We're doing a lot of regen at the moment just to try and bring it back. But if you guys can get this into your gardens, it's absolutely magical stuff. It's kind of like Australia's version of aloe vera. It's completely edible. The whole plant's edible. And when this beautiful flower dies off at the end of summer, you get this gorgeous little fruit at the end of it, and they taste like salty strawberries. They're absolutely delicious. So it takes on the flavour of the environment, which is beautiful. You get it from the coastline, it's going to taste salty, it's going to taste briny, which means that you don't have to add as much salt into your food, 
which is also why I love to use natives at Kakala. I barely use any salt in my food because the natives naturally take up a lot of salt from the soils or from the environment, from the sea spray, which means I'm not adding high volumes of salt into my food. This is absolutely beautiful. It was used by you know, early settlers because of its high, high vitamin C content to treat scurvy and all sorts of things like that. My nan never taught me that, but what she used to teach me is that if you ever got a sting down at the beach, an ant bit you or a mosquito or anything like that, break it, rub it on your skin. Or if you ever had an upset stomach, um, break it into a gel, mix it with water and gently drink it to help soothe your stomach. I mean, whether that's proved by Western science or not, this stuff is definitely worth looking into. And I really think that a lot of our native foods are probably one of the most undervalued resources that we have. When you look at trying to look at future medicines, we know that you know, things like the kakadu palm that I've got in here now, is they're looking at research around that because of its extremely high vitamin C content. This is nature's medicine, you know what I mean? And this is what our old people lived of. And when I look at those photos of my great-great-great-great-grandmother and my great-great-great-great-uncle, I think, my God, they were bloody fit people. And he looked cranky, but he looked fit. Okay, what else have I got for you guys? Our native ginger that I talked about. So those are the blue little seeds. So the membrane around the seed is what you could eat. You can actually eat the seeds themselves, but the seeds were that was used to actually to spit around and to actually mark their trails. It's absolutely gorgeous. Who's seen this one here? It grows everywhere, guys. Warrigal greens. This is Australia's very own native spinach. Absolutely gorgeous stuff. It takes on the flavour of the environment too. So if you get this down at the beach, it's going to be super salty. I think Captain Cook ended up calling this botany, botany spinach because um, he, helped, he treated a lot of his crew with it because of the scurvy that they had. But this is our very own wild spinach. And isn't it an absolute delight? I found a really good way to get kids to eat their greens is by getting them to eat the flowers when the flowers come out because the flowers on this are bright and yellow. And I say, if you can eat the flowers, you can eat the leaves. And they absolutely love it. But this is our very own native spinach. And it grows like an absolute weed. I can't imagine why we're not growing this more, why we don't find this in our grocery stops, and why we don't find this in our kitchens at homes because it's delicious, it's really nutrient dense, it behaves the same way as you would in English spinach, but it just tastes better. So this is the kind of stuff that I really feel like we should be embracing at home. It's absolutely gorgeous, huge content of vitamin C as well, and obviously loaded with antioxidants because of that beautiful greenery, an absolute super plan, so easy to grow, and if you start to grow it at home, be careful because it will take over your garden. But it's a great ground cover if you need a bit of a ground cover. And then I've got this one here. You guys must have heard of the superfood kakadu plums. You've heard of it, right? Well, believe it or not, it's not from kakadu. That's a great marketing campaign. It sounds good and it's taken off, but it's not from kakadu. This is actually from Western Australia. And thank God they are still in a stage where this is being traditionally foraged by traditional communities, which is a big part of native foods. It's really sad to think that in a $20 million industry that it's been valued out, and I think that's conservative, that only 2% of that is actually going back into Indigenous hands. That's a real shame because the knowledge around this food actually comes from ancient knowledge that's been passed on from generations. So there needs to be a bit of a shift of that. But this is gubbinge, and I actually really like the traditional names. A lot of people say to me, well, why do you call it the traditional name? traditional name for kakala is kakala, or, or it's not pig face, obviously, or yuli. Isn't that a nice name? And when I get feedback about traditional names, I often get, it's too hard for people to say Aboriginal words. And I think, but we're so open to embracing Italian words. We're so open to embracing all sorts of language and influence into Australia, which is a great thing. It is a wonderful thing because I love that we're multicultural but why not have an open heart to Aboriginal language too? And such a great way for us to connect is to know the place that we work, live and play, to know the traditional owners, to know a little bit of the lingo of that area. Why not? You know, I always greet people with Jingila, which is hello in my language. Jigiwala, which is hello and welcome. I say Bugulbe, which is thank you. If we learn those words, we're connecting with the cultures and those ancient knowledge systems. We're also paying our respects to the, you know, those ancient ancestors that have been here for thousands of years. And it's a beautiful thing to bring recognition to First Nations culture into the modern world. 
So I say, why not? What do you guys reckon? Health benefits of this, 50 times the vitamin C of an orange. Can you believe it? In this tiny little thing, and of course the issue with a lot of our native foods is because they're wild forage, is that they don't have that consistency across the board and that's why it's hard to get them into the commercial market. We're trying to do work on that at the moment to get a little bit more consistency. It took us a little while to get used to ugly fruit when it came to organics, so I'm hopeful we'll have an open heart when it comes to native foods. But it's absolutely delicious. Still wild foraged by indigenous communities, which is amazing. Super high in vitamin C and best enjoyed when it falls from the tree. So a lot, like a lot of the ancient knowledge that my nan shared with me, fruit was not ripe and not ready to eat until it, had a, it was just about to fall or had fallen to the floor. And that's got a lot to do with this stuff too. The vitamin C content in this is actually at its best when it falls naturally to the ground. And maybe the tree's just had enough of it by that point and wants to get rid of it. But that's when the vitamin C content is at its best. It's absolutely incredible. So I'm going to kind of give you guys a little bit of food for thought. I'm a chef. I didn't feed you today, unfortunately. I'd love to feed you all. And hopefully if you come to Byron Bay, you'll be able to come and visit me at my restaurant, talk about this beautiful stuff, come out on country and experience what Byron Bay, I feel, is really all about. But connect with our culture. We all have a longingness for connection right now, and I think particularly in Australia. We realised throughout the pandemic just how fortunate we were or are to call this country home. And we probably, the benefit of it is that we looked in. We looked in, we realised how special this country really is and how fortunate we are. So I challenge you to connect with your First Nations country and the culture that you live on. Figure out the name of the traditional people, the traditional country you live on, the language they spoke, and try and find some of your traditional foods. Know that your native food landscape of where you live. Try to grow some of these at home. They will take off in your garden, you will have food for the future, and you'll be able to integrate some of these beautiful First Nations foods into your home kitchens. So Boogle Bay Yahweh, it's been a pleasure for me and a privilege to be able to share some of my passion and my culture with you. I hope I've inspired some of you mob to get out there and get some of this beautiful native food into your home kitchens because that's really where it belongs and hopefully into your gardens too. Thank you. Can we have the uh, house lights up for people who might want to ask some questions and make some comments? So let me just get down and dirty with this. I mean, so let's take the spinach, for example. Do you, is that raw in a salad? Can you cook it? I mean, what's... what's you don't do a cooking story. lesson now? Sorry? Cooking lesson? Yeah. Yeah, why not? So this has actually got quite That's a high content for. of oxalates in it. So you, they say that you shouldn't eat too much of it before blanching it, but use it exactly the same way that you would spinach. Stir fries in salads. You can bake it any kind of spinach recipe you can come by. I even make a beautiful Warrigal green pesto out of this, which is absolutely delicious but it's so super versatile. You can use it in any way. I think people get really scared around native food because they don't know how to use it, but it's got, everything's got, a, I guess, um, something that you can kind of exchange it for. I use lemon myrtle instead of bay leaves in my cooking, for instance. So substitutes, that's the word I was looking for, substitutes. So instead of using bay leaves, I use lemon myrtle, and it imparts this beautiful lemony flavour into your broths, into your stews, or anything like that. So I think it's just thinking a little bit broader and outside the circle when it comes to native food. But I can smell this sitting in front of me, and I'd love you guys to come down and smell some of this stuff. Have a smell of this. I didn't talk mm. about this. Native thyme. It's People like don't realise it's... Na yeah, it's got a, a menthol kind of eucalyptus kind of note to it too. Extremely powerful stuff. So when you're using natives, you only need a small amount. So if it says three bay leaves, use one lemon myrtle. If it, use, it says use a sprig of thyme, I would be using a tiny, tiny little. That's as much as what you need. Isn't that incredible? Because of the, 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 fla the flavour kind of content in it, it is very powerful in terms of the flavour. I didn't talk about this one. Who knows this one here? It's tiny. Can you guys see it? They're usually a bit bigger than this. This is called gulalung in our lingo. Citrus caviar. Any clues? Finger lime. Finger lime. Absolutely beautiful. This is the original citrus. So this is where most of the modern day citruses that we actually enjoy today, like oranges and lemons and whatnot, actually stem from this beautiful native fruit. And this is, we call it bundjalung caviar. We want to claim it because it comes from our rainforest up home. But it's absolutely incredible. 
huge amount of vitamin C content in, content in that as well, but it's got way more aroma than a typical citrus. So it's more kind of like a Tahitian lime and kaffir lime kind of flavour notes that you get in that than you would out of a typical citrus. How absolutely glorious and beautiful. Okay, now let's move on with the cooking lesson. <laughs> um, I need some pots and pans up here. Yeah, yeah, we do. So, <laughs> Uh, you know, in Mediterranean cooking, you would start with like a sofrito. You'd start with oil, extra virgin olive oil. You might chop onions and stuff like that. Is there? A, do you need to do that with um, native cooking? I mean, do you do you do you start you know to release the flavors? Or? I like to keep it basic. I think the best thing about food is just to keep it simple. I mean, you're talking flash stuff here, sofritos. You must get into the kitchen a bit, do you? I have to get you on the pans at Kakala when you come up at Christmas. Food, the food is best when it's simple, honestly. Like some of the best food and the most popular dishes that we have at Kakala are the ones that are done with, with the most simplicity. We do a beautiful steamed fish with a native kombu broth. So we go down and collect native kelp. When after the floods have hit, obviously we haven't had much luck with it. Kombu, kelp, and we actually brine, create a brine that we create a stock base out of. And it literally has native ginger, it has kombu and native kelp and it has a little bit of dashi and it has nothing else. And the flavour and the, and the intensity that comes out of that is just like nothing else. We try not to, I think Western kind of thinking is that we layer flavours on, more is more, and honestly it just overloads the palate and you get really confused. And to try and adjust things and fix it, you end up adding more salt, sugars and all sorts of things to balance everything out. thing with native foods, it's so powerful in terms of its flavour profile you just need a little bit, not too much, and cook it sim simply. You know, cook it over fire or cook it in a stir fry. Steam it. Kakala is beautiful steamed. You can steam this and it's absolutely delicious. You can chop it up and throw it in your salad. You can pickle it. There are so many things that you can do with it. You know, it's absolutely gorgeous. We make a really mean Kakala martini out of this too, would you believe? How good is that? I like my cocktails too. Um, I mean, in terms of the restaurant, I mean, some of the world's most expensive restaurants consider themselves to be foraging restaurants. Yeah. So they forage for the food. I'm not sure how they do it for the pork or the lamb, but nonetheless. <laughs> um, do you consider yourself a foraging, a foraging restaurant as well as... Is that over there? I mean, what percentage of the ingredients you use in the restaurant are forage? Oh, look, I'm, I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, foraging is kind of one of those trendy words that just come on the scene that make you sound like a cool kind of hipster or something. I'm not hip, I'm not cool, I'm not any of those things. I'm just a bunch of long women just running cool. a little business. So, but I do get out on country. All these came from my garden this morning. So when I got up, I know it was an early flight for me. I had to get up at 4.30 this morning to come down, um, catch a flight down. I got out in my backyard and I grabbed all of these. So if I can grow this, I'm telling you anybody can because I don't have a green thumb. And I got out there, but I would say probably at least 30% of my native fresh produce comes from my home garden. And when I can't get it from home, I often take my crew down to the beach. I take them down to Ballina or down to, you know, wherever it's kind of, um, I guess, prolific at that time. We went bottle seed harvesting. And I tell you what, you will never appreciate bread or grain more unless you've been bottle seed harvesting, you've dried roasted it, then you've ground it out, and then you've tried to make bread out of it. I mean, wattle seed is one of those beautiful nat native grains. It's gluten-free. It's high in protein. It's got an absolute amazing flavour profile. It tastes like coffee and chocolate. It's loaded full of protein. So no wonder our First Nations people were so healthy because they weren't loading themselves up on carbs. But unless you go through that process of actually collecting a grain, drying it out, moving it from its seed pod and grinding it down into make a flour, I mean, you, you, you really appreciate food when you go to those lengths. That's for sure. Yes. I think they'll bring it up. Hello. Yep, yep. you're on. Hi, I'm Trish. I'm from Aranda Country. Um, and you are. Yeah, hello. Um, one of the things I find is when we're um, talking about some of our native foods is I end up answering a me and a one text on how do I use this, where does it go? Is there a book that you've put together? That's <laughs> there, yeah, I know. I keep on getting hassled to write one, actually, and I, oh man, I wish I had the time to actually do it because I love to teach. I love to teach. I love to teach people how to cook and use it. But there is a couple of really great books out. One's called Creative Native. And there's, um, and now we've just got, a, it's called, I think it's a Native Food Companion. Get that one. It's written by a First Nations gentleman. They go through all the substitutes as well. So what you'll find is they've got pages and pages and pages of substitutes. What would be an, a typical 
ingredient that we would use in westernised cooking, they'll give you your, your First Nations substitute. So that's one I would definitely recommend. Yes. Did that work? Yeah. yeah. Um, India, thank you. Um, that was a great presentation. We learned so much about all your amazing stuff that I've never seen before. Um, my question kind of pertains to <coughs> um, the food insecurities in rural Indigenous communities. Um, I've done a placement in Palm Island, Dumaji, and in these places, like, there aren't a lot of fresh vegetables available, or they're either stale or really, really expensive. Oh, it's a dire, lot of isn't it? processed foods. It's heartbreaking. Food. It absolutely. is. Mm, like a lot of processed foods, and and with that we come, we see all the comorbidities that exist that comes along with it. What I, I guess the question is like, you know, you're encouraging us to, you know, to start using these in our cuisines, but how can we get our indigenous patients? Um, or, you know, indigenous communities to start I mean, reverting and going Such back a great to question. These. Such a great question. And it's definitely something that I'm passionate about. You know, I am starting up a, a, a project called the Jarjum Native Food Project because we're trying to encourage opportunities for nurse, First Nations people to be growing First Nations food. The reality is, deep, uh, deep, why can't I say the word? Deep, <laughs> when people were depossessed, that's what I'm trying to go for. Dispossessed. Dispossessed, thank you from their land, like for, for, for instance, for, for my nan, when she was feeding her kids, she got to the point where she was, she was getting in trouble for trespassing on people's land, right? She grew up eating with her, her, her aunties, her nan, her mum, foraging, going out hunting and gathering. When she was trying to feed her kids, got to the point where when she was going onto people's properties that typically she was allowed to go on when she was a little girl because it went to private hands or whatever, they got shot off their land that broke a lot of those cultural practices from happening and it broke a lot of those cultural practices from being taught and passed on. And it's really hard to get back. So what we're trying to do at the moment, because a great way for us to reconnect, not only you know, non-Indigenous people to culture, but First Nations people back to their culture, is through this, their beautiful native food. And I want them to feel a sense of pride, just like I want you fellas to feel a sense of pride in this stuff too. So what we're trying to do is actually do kind of share benefit with farmers, private landowners, to say, let's get mob on land to start growing some of those foods that grow traditionally in their areas. You know, like this kind of stuff is not going to grow up in Arnhem land. You know what I mean? You want the stuff that's going to grow prolific to that area, the stuff that's got connection to their culture, their stories, their song lines and their dreaming, because this stuff is all connected to that. So we are trying to start up a project at the moment. I'm trying to start locally so I can do it, you know, in Byron and around my Bundjalan country. We're even starting native food gardens in the schools around because I really believe the kids are the future. When you start to teach kids things like this, they're going to take it home and teach their, their parents about it. But we do need to encourage community initiatives to get kids back and communities back on their land, but having access to land where they can grow this stuff. And that's what it's all about. Time for one more question or comment? Yes, in the middle. Uh, hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk today. Uh, Pleasure. Fantastic and uh, inspirational to get, uh, get back into the roots of all these things. Great. Um, you mentioned briefly before uh, how little of the, so the Kakadu Plum boom, for example, has found its way into Indigenous hands. Could you give any, I guess, a comment or thoughts about how we could make sure we're supporting, I guess, Indigenous food sovereignty over Great question. some very savvy... Loving these questions, guys, and thank you for your support as well. It's so important. I love that this is a growing industry. I love that it's become a fad. I love because it gives me a chance to talk about it, but it also gives us a chance to address those type of issues as well. Look for First Nations, either owned or partnership businesses. And if you go into Supply Nation, you'll be able to find out that the, those First Nations businesses that are actually you know, growing, producing, and putting this stuff out into the marketplace, but we need more of it, and that's the thing. But we need the consumer to be supporting that as well. And to be honest, we're not in a position at the moment to be getting this stuff into a huge retail kind of market. We're not going to see it in Coles and Woolies anytime soon. That's my next big plan because I'd love to see this in there. But just check for supply nation status and that will give you an indication that that is actually a First Nations business and or at least a First Nations partner, which is really important. Supply nation will basically indicate that the business is at least 50% Indigenous owned. So... Good tip. Mindy, that's been fantastic. Thank you very much for being here. Boogle Bear Yahweh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> you all can have a sniff later. It's amazing, truly amazing. 
Known as Marla Pinyi Malawini, the painter of light, Wayne Quilliam is an Aboriginal storyteller like no other. His extensive travels to every corner of the globe, working with Indigenous people, gives him a unique perspective on connection and creativity. In his artistic universe, Wayne defers to knowledge and teaching of the ancestors as, she, as he shares his cre creative spirit, expressing cultural knowledge through immersive art. He's an Indigenous Literacy Foundation ambassador and sits on the board of the Australian Aboriginal Art Association. Please welcome Wayne. We've got, we've got a little one. Come here, tiger. Where are you, mama? <laughs> Look at that. I've got help already. Where are you, sis? Ah, uh, there's mama over there. Hey, I'll let you go. There you go. You're right, good girl. Uh, yo, mum, Mark. My name's Wayne Quillam, and uh, thank you for. <laughs> I love this. This is the only way to do do a presentation. It's um, the funny thing is we, we actually know each other from um, when we were working, I was helping with the Indigenous Doctors Association, videos and photos. How many years ago, sis? A while ago now, wasn't it? Six years ago? So I've been working in health and education for over 35 years on our communities and this is why I do it. This is, I, I'm actually not going to do a thing. I'm just going to let this one take over the whole thing and actually do the presentation for me. I love this. Look at that. Well done. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> well done. <laughs> oh, that makes me laugh. And th th this is what I love about our culture and our communities is that so many people see the, the seriousness of it. But the wonderful thing is out there is there's so much humour, there's so much love, there's so much for our, for our children. And it's really special and so funny to, to actually something, see something like this. So you've got to concentrate on me a little bit. Uh, watch the floor show because it's way better. <laughs> thank you, Norman. Appreciate that, brother. And thanks, sis, for giving that beautiful introduction and that beautiful knowledge. I learnt so much myself. And it's important that we do connect back to country and particularly with our foods is because you know, it's where we come from, it's sustenance of life that keeps us going. My name's Wayne Quillam. Yeah. Malawini Pinyini was a name given to me by, unfortunately, old uncle that's since passed away. And um, I can't say his name, but it means the painter of light. And photography is my love and my passion. And it's something that I love to share our culture. And through you know, videos, photography, this is how I do it. My country is Tasmania. I'm a Palawa man. I left there back in the 70s. Still connected back there through my brother and my mother and my, my family. I am a father of three my daughter, my wife, I've got two older sons 
and I've got four grandchildren all still live in Tasmania that are that such a beautiful, beautiful family. I'm an artist, sometimes, not all the time, but this is a painting of my country. Uh, the, I'm a freshwater man and I painted this. It's the first painting I ever did and I haven't done one since. But my art, uh, I'm leaving it there, so years to come it'll be a million dollars. Anyone got their um, credit card? No. I'm an author. Culture is Life is the book that I bought out right at the beginning of COVID. We, um, I produced it. It took me a couple of years to put it together. 35 years, 6 million images into this beautiful book. I was about to head up to um, Ballarat to launch the book. COVID hit. Stopped it. Cleaned its tracks. Uh, so we decided we are going to do it at home. I was out in the garden doing a simple little chore, bent over, back went, hospital. I launched it in Ballarat Base Hospital. <laughs> Seriously, this, I kid you not, I've got photos of me in Ballarat Base Hospital lying there with this book with photos. So the medical profession is um, intertwined throughout my career. I'm an ambassador for the Indigenous Literature Foundation. For those who haven't heard of it, it is such an incredible organisation that I have a passion for, not only to document and record their stories and share their vision of educating our kids, because my belief is that we get our, our, our kids in particular healthy and happy and we educate them, we're on the front foot. We've got somewhere to move. We all know this, but helping with ILF, this was three, four weeks ago out in uh, Ananu, Pitanjara, Yunkinjara lands, OPY lands in Central Desert. And I took my 14-year-old daughter out there with me who helped me and we were sitting the, this, this little one up on the rock and she just couldn't stop laughing because all the books they're creating are in language, English and language. It's only a small community, only about 24 people in this little community. And they told the story of where their grandfather, who was quite light-skinned, and the police kept, hello, is she back? Where are you going, Tiger? She doesn't matter. <laughs> Oh, watch out, I'm getting to look. This, this is it. This is, this is so beautiful, and that's why these kids are so beautiful. But sorry, I do tend to jump around because I have so many stories and such passion for telling them. But they were talking about their great-great-grandfather who basically was a light-skinned black fella out there, and the police kept trying to take him away, and this is where he used to hide. He, he hid there for years, so he wasn't taken away from community. So this little one now being able to record their stories in language and sitting out on country is extraordinary. I'm a fashion designer. I dabble in everything. Master of none, but try everything. So this is my fashion label that we launched. <laughs> well, we didn't necessarily launch because it was meant to be launched in Russia. So, yeah, you know, I'm just not quite hitting the mark at the moment, but yeah, I will, <laughs> I'm going to come back sometime. I'm going to say, you know what, we did launch it. It's probably in outer space with Elon Musk, but... So my artwork, as you see on, the, on these beautiful jackets, I work with a designers down in Melbourne in a fashion house in Italy. And we bought this beautiful Indigenous fashion label together, which will be launched one day. Also, the co-owner of the first Indigenous wine label, Mount Yengo. We bought that together as a commercial enterprise to get out there and showcase our business, Indigenous businesses, it's strong, it's healthy, we're very professional in what we do. Originally I started, see the labels on the bottles, I originally started as the artist, but during COVID I decided to buy into the company and now we are basically exporting to the world now, we're exporting our stories, our knowledge, our art. Uh, how many of you might be from Sydney? Anybody go to the Vivid um, Festival? Anyone see the projections? You saw it? Vivid Festival is this beautiful light projection show. Uh, again, delayed two years <laughs> that I had this in the making. First time Aboriginal art has been projected onto all the four pillars of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So I share my stories on, on a, a stage where we share culture. We share it in such a way that it's vibrant and it's beautiful. Canberra. How many people from Canberra do we have in here? A few. Any of you have visited the National Museum by any chance lately? No? Come on, you've got to culture yourself here, Mel. I, during, again, during COVID, 
I sat down and I had, you know, six million images, God knows how many artworks and um, videos. And a company down in, in Victoria said, we run these shows, Van Gogh, Monet, Da Vinci, these interactive light experiences across the world, but we've never done an Australian one. So I sat down with a, a guy called Adam Knight and we curated this show. We brought together over 100 living and past artists to bring this show that was launched at the National Museum in Canberra earlier this year. And we're about to take it around the world to share our knowledge, our experience and our culture through the arts. So I'm not sure if, um, where we're taking it next, but um, hopefully you just pop along and have a look. Who recognises the one there in the middle? Any pop fans here? Jess Malboy. I was um, recently out working with Jess um, on country, on her country up in Northern Territory, developing her new film clips and new videos. The reason I wanted to share, a lot of these, these photos are a passion for me because I get to tell stories in a different way. And working with this young woman, with these children out there, the, the happiness and the joy that she brings communities is so incredible. She's also an ILF ambassador as well. This is me looking flash. Look, I got the stance. Where's my little one? I need her to come and help me. <laughs> so I'm just big note myself now, so I look flash and I know what I'm talking about. So this year, fortunately enough, I won the National Photographic Portrait Award. So see that photo in the background there just behind me, the good-looking fella, Eric Young and Pora. Uh, I was working... Anyone been to the Laura Dance Festival far north Queensland? Oh, you, oh a few of you. That incredible gathering of all the tribes from in particular from far north Queensland. I've been doing that for, I think, 25 years. And I was up there on the side just before um, the mob from Arakoon were going out on Bungal, on, dan on the dance ground. And I said to this young fellow, I said, brother, I said, geez, you look familiar. There's something I just can't... He said, yeah, we know who you are. He said, you've been photographing our community for so long. You've photographed one of the famous photos of my great-grandfather. And I said, wow, and we started talking and I brought the photo up on my phone and showed him. He said, yeah, that's him. And I said, brother, do you mind if I just quickly grab a photo of you for you know, continuity? We put it in the um, portrait awards and um, the wonderful thing is the judges decided that it was worthy of winning it and since then, and the beautiful thing is a mate of mine also won the, um, now I've had a total mind blank. Come on, you might help me. What's that famous art award, the painting award? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an interactive experience <laughs> because sometimes I'm getting old now so sometimes it just so Adam funnily enough who painted the Archibald is actually here in camera as well and he, he just messaged me to tell me that he's here as well so it's the first time two Aboriginal artists have won two of the biggest awards at the same time yeah come on you might give us a clap Adam's, Adam's got the talent but again it's the sharing of stories which, which gives me such a passion at any time, if this is all right with you, Norman, do, you, do we want to wait to the end for people to ask questions or whilst we're doing Whatever it? you want to do. Yeah, I, I'd prefer, if it's all right with you, Mob, is that if you see a photo and after I've had a yarn about it, you want to know there's something about it or something more, ask me now because otherwise we'll go back to it because it's important. This is how we storytell. This young one here, she came up to me. I was working now in the community of the Cathy Freeman Foundation and she, it was actually her parents who adopted her, who were German, said, listen, she's this, this dancer, she wants to dance, she wants to be one of the first Aboriginal dancers, in the, you know, a ballet dancer. She said, can you help us? Can you take some photos? I said, I'd love to, however, however I can help. So she went out there, she dressed up in her tutu, we got her out on country. Every second day, her parents drive her 200 kilometres down and back again in a place called Warrabinda, were everyone, a few people heard of Warrabinda up in Queensland? Yeah? And she's now down at the Sydney Dance Academy. So that's the passion of, of working together, experiencing something different. Indigenous lawyers. I, I was working with a, a, a law firm, New South Wales, sorry, Law Association. And they said, you know, we want to show through photos and videos the diversity of Indigenous people, in particular our lawyers. I had the great fortune that we sat down. She just spent five years in London at a top law firm talking about um, corporate law. And she's come back now to work on our communities and talk about actually 
everything from food and cultural knowledge and how we can better understand it and how we can better use it. Fun. And remember I said fun when, when we had Bubba there? Oh, sorry, someone I was going to ask a question. Sorry. Huh? No, I just wanted to go back to the children's book stories. Yes, yeah, sis. It's something that I was doing some work up um, in Hopevale. Oh, yep. And the, the, the kids had got together with the high schools and they were starting to write some of the stories down as children's stories in language. Fantastic. And in English. But um, I saw it twice there and I actually brought them back and, and, and read them. But they're amazing books. And I think I just wanted to share that if somehow people connected can get some of these stories written and published. Mm. They're amazing. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And that's what it's about. If we all work together as, you know, as Australians, you know, we've got our stories, we want to share our stories, but we need people to work with us. So you know, bringing that to the table is, is, is an incredible thought. And I'm, when I won that National Portrait Award, is that it was $20,000 worth of Canon equipment, cameras, and 30,000 bucks for first prize. And I stood there and my wife and daughter were there and I turned around and said, you know what we need to do with this? And my wife just said, yeah, I know. <laughs> said, oh God, here he goes. So I got up and I did my speech. I said, right, the whole lot goes back to our communities. That $20,000 worth of cameras all just rocked up into our house. So they're all sitting there and all the money goes back to starting to run digital literacy programs and stuff to teach kids photography, recording of stories and using modern technology to progress and to, to keep hold of a lot of our knowledge. Um, if anybody's out there that's interested, we're looking for corporate sponsors as well to help us get out to a lot more communities. So everything, that all the cameras and all the gear I've got, once we teach people how to use them, it will stay on community and we'll try and attempt to keep going back. And at the beginning of next year's Portrait Awards here in Canberra, we're gonna try and have our own little exhibition that shows what we've done with um, all the prize. Nice segue, sis. Thank you for that. Humour and fun. I mean, Crikey, just look at there. This is the um, 25th anniversary of uh, SBS. And these two here, I, I had to throw this photo in because people see culture so seriously. But I see the humour in it, the fun in it. And these two just, uh, you can see in their faces, they just have far too good a time. Culture. What is culture? I grew up without it. I grew up as a young Aboriginal man knowing I was Aboriginal. My grandmother wouldn't tell me anything because she was stolen Jen. She told my grandfather who was German. So when we used to go on country, he told us the stories, not her, because she was too ashamed to tell. Whereas now my culture all comes from learning. I travel, there's literally not a community in, in the country that I haven't travelled to, that I haven't worked with. And that's where I gather all my knowledge and, and, and share it with the world. This year was particularly important because we're out on a small community called Millencarpity and we arrived up there and I was doing a corporate shoot and we walked in and I said, oh, there's nobody on community. There's something not quite right. And uh, as we were walking down from the airstrip, I saw this mob walking across the beach and then we realised that an old person had passed and they were doing a smoking ceremony. And, you know, for those who don't know, you know, the smoking ceremony is to cleanse the house, cleanse the area that... Um, that old person was in. So I immediately put the cameras down, turned around and said, listen, we can't shoot this. We're not, you know, this is just, it's culturally inappropriate to do it. This just doesn't feel right. And then all of a sudden I heard out of the corner, hey, Wayne, and look around. All the uncles are sitting there doing ceremony under the tree. He said, what are you doing here? And I told him, he said, listen, you go and photograph our ceremony and send the photos back to us. And after we finish, then you can do your shoot. Now that wouldn't have happened years ago. Years ago, we could have been in there, couldn't maybe not go back for months. Whereas now, the documentation of, of culture and to share these stories with a young one has become so important. And that's why, who's, who's heard of that old adage is if you take an Aboriginal person's photo, you take the spirit? Yeah, a few mob. Ah, so at least someone put up their hand. I've been asked this question so many times. It's um, absolute rubbish. You go out in community, this mob love their photos taken. I turn around and say, oh, my brother, watch out. <laughs> Different in the old days, but now documentation is important. 
special photo of this one is because there was a thing called the 1967 referendum flight. It was so, so important and what they did is they recreated it a, a few years ago and I was privileged to be on the, the flight from Sydney to Canberra and these are our, these are our uh, actually legends. I, there, there's no appropriate word to explain the importance of what these people did back in you know, 67. And unfortunately, a lot are no longer with us, but I still get contacted. And like, see right in the middle there, Aunty Lewicho O'Donoghue, probably one of the most incredible women, not Aboriginal women, women in this country. She's still with us. She's a bit of a recluse at the moment because she's still a bit ill. But the knowledge I worked with many years ago in an organisation called ATSIC and the power and the strength of progressing Indigenous people's rights, I just sat there in awe as a young man watching her. So that's why I brought this photo along to show you these are the, um, the incredible people that work in our communities. Indigenous business is a massive, massive thing for me. As Sister Girl was talking about before, is there's an organisation called Supply Nation. Supply Nation is basically you know, our Chamber of Commerce and it's quite strict in its rules about you know, Indigenous ownership of a business to work out there. I still see, I believe that you know, the welfare system and, and the money that goes out on the communities is still important. But I think progressing our future is through business, through the private sector, to ensure that we have strong, educated, young Aboriginal men and women that are working on community, and they don't have to work for us as a community, but what they need to do is recognise that every time there's spend on Indigenous business, it goes back to our communities in a circular way. The importance of this photo here, this is the first ever Indigenous-owned airport in the world. So this is up uh, just north of Broome, about 200 kilometres north of Broome, and I just happened to be there on the day that they launched it. It was just by accident I was doing a, a shoot further up the community. And they come back and said, hey, brother, can you photograph this for us? And here's these two men. These choppers here, what happens is between Broome and all the gas and oil fields out off of north of Broome there, is they've got to have a, um, an emergency stop-off point for the helicopter to land and to refuel in case cyclones come through. So it's a, but what they've found now, they're actually dropping in there, they're refuelling and putting a lot of the passengers on now that takes these, I think they're... they're $20 million choppers out to the oil and the gas rigs. And what happens is the beautiful thing about this is the way that their roster system works is that they're highly and professionally trained that they can work at any airport in the world. But the rule is, is that if, say, you've got, you've got sorry business or you want to go fishing, if you're covered off and the airport's running at capacity, you can go and do your own thing. So it's sort of like your know, culture meets LHS, sort of. <laughs> One of my funniest all time photos, again, uh, working with Kathy Freeman Foundation, which is, is another education sort of point, is that we were out on this small community called Elko Island. I'll never forget it. We, was, we, were, out, we were out on one of these back roads. And Kathy was out there because the women said, oh, Kath, will you just come and do a little bit of a run, a little bit of a jog for us? I said, no drama. We went out to this back road. Kathy and I were standing there waiting for the, the ladies to run out and they were going to run off and I was going to do some photos. All of a sudden we could hear this noise coming out of the bushes. And I said, I turned around and said, there's a bloody chipmunks on this island. And she went, what? And she turned around and these kids burst out of the bushes from the top of that road and they were running at Kathy like you wouldn't believe. She's standing behind me. She's going, brother, brother, you've got to stop. You've got to, you've got to stop for me. And I'm just taking photos. And they all gathered around it. And the joy and the happiness that, that she showed these kids. And since then, a lot of them have gone on to do the New York Marathon. Um, they're travelling the world at the moment. So the inspiration, the happiness from our, our leaders is so important to the health and well-being of our communities. But I put my daughter in. She always gives me a hard time. The ceremony is such an important thing to our, to our communities and this is up in um, Three Rivers Festival up in um, Yachuka, Moama. And old auntie painted her up and told her her stories because she was born in Victoria, not in my country, in Tasmania, so I can't teach her my stories. So the auntie's now teach her on Victoria. 
and they made her that beautiful headdress, the Amy Feather headdress up, and you see the joy and the happiness, and she now travels with me on so many different places. She's this beautiful, healthy, happy Aboriginal woman that will do amazing things. This little one here, if, I, if I'm going too fast to stop me because I just keep running on. Sorry, brother, yeah. Never, never a dumb one, brother. Just that throwaway comment you mentioned where, you know, country is such an important part of Aboriginal and First Nations identity. In the kind of 21st century where lots of people move around, they marry into different family groups and networks, how on earth does cultural teaching work? You, I mean, you just had a throwaway comment that you can't teach your daughter your mm. stories. Is that a a cultural thing that you shouldn't? Is it a, a knowledge thing? I, I just have no idea how that works. Oh, it's a fantastic question, uh, and I'll be honest, it is so in-depth, there's so many strands to it, there's so many different areas that, that, uh, that this conversation could take us, and we would literally need hours. And, and thank you, it's a brilliant question. What happens, it, it, this is from my perspective, from where I come from. For, I speak for no other Aboriginal person, tribe or knowledge keeper. But because I can't teach my daughter the knowledge that I, I can share from my own country, she's, she's getting the knowledge from the uncles and aunties on the land that, that she was born. So she was born on country in Victoria, so she's Wathorong. So the uncles and aunties from the Roth, Wathorong are teaching her the stories of country and of land. I sit there, sit in the background and listen, and I absorb them because it'll be a part of her future that I will help remember and help guide her as she moves on. A lot of my knowledge comes from, say, the Yongu, for instance. I've spent a lot of time in Arnhem Land over the 30-odd years, and they, 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 they brought out books and maps and graphs and knowledge things, circles of, of country and, and of song lines and of, of the, the family tree, in a way, if you can put it that simply. I get totally lost. It is so difficult as an Aboriginal man who has a reasonable amount of knowledge to try and explain myself to others, let alone as the bigger picture. But um, there's, bo there's books coming out that are actually explaining a lot of this stuff. So I'll, um, I'll try and send the info across. Half a question, half an answer. I'm sorry, it was sort of like a little bit... <laughs> Always happy to, bud. Uh, this is the most recent photo, and, and this was so important to me because this is, again, the um, AFL grand final out in APY lands. I'll be documenting a lot of our... You see, we now use community gatherings, football matches, um, soccer, um, baseball, all these sporting carnivals now are our modern-day cultural gatherings. And what happens is not only you know, is the football and, and all the sporting events are on, but everybody comes in to share their knowledge. And this is how knowledge is starting to be passed along now because it's unfortunately a lot of our gatherings are at funerals. So when we have a, a happy event like a, a grand final, these kids come along and they're picking up the information from others at the football. And I know it sounds like you know, a lot of people go, well, how's football carnival a cultural gathering? But it is, it's a special gathering because it allows cross-pollination, the, the discussion of culture, in a, a more, I suppose, open manner. And it's just, I, I, I was standing there looking at her, and she's a Mad Tigers supporter, and so am I, so. The happiness and the joy of kids and a father. I mean, I was talking to brother boy here before, and I, was, I always ask before I take a photo, I said, brother, you know, do you mind? Yeah, yeah, go for it. And just off the cuff, this beautiful photo of this little one, I was doing the grandfather thing, I was, <laughs> sorry about that. And he's doing this, and he's laughing, and Dad's laughing, we're all laughing. And I find that happiness and making, you know, as a grandfather, I've learned over the years, it gives me, I don't know, a unique insight into when I, before when I was younger, I was all go, trying to gather knowledge, trying to, trying to build myself, whereas now it's quite relaxed, and the joy and the happiness of kids and dads makes me happy and I find that if it makes me happy when people are looking at the photos it makes them happy too. It sees a different side of our, our people. 
medical ones now. I thought I'd better throw a few medical ones in, eh? It's, um, this is important. This is with the younger and their auntie there is you know, basically stripping the paperback off, getting ready for basically a, a, a women's ceremony, which I can't tell you about, but I can tell you the process of, of basically their talking as they're stripping the bark, as they're getting ready for the smoking, and they basically make a hut out of it. And the women go in, and that's about the end of what I can tell you about that. But the importance of the storytelling whilst out on country, the knowledge that these two are passing along is incredibly powerful. And the people that have come out of a lot of these, these ceremonies are very open to, to new ideas and new concepts because it's, it's a powerful thing to be connected back to country. Old uncle here, he's, um, he's from, well, he's about 18 hours drive south of Darwin, um, called a Nunkery. Nunkery is a medicine man. He shares the stories and knowledge of all medicines and healings. And in particular, as you know, you know with the, the boomerangs there, not all of them are for catching food, but for ceremony and, and for, for knowledge and for sharing knowledge. So this here, very powerful photo, and uh, he's still with us, fortunately. Anyone heard of Magnolia Maymaru? Yeah? Yeah, Magnolia is this incredible young woman. You know, I, I, you know, when she was this high, I was photographing her and her farm, family up at um, the Gama Festival, and she started, you know, she's growing and growing and growing, and then she became a model. And then she's gracing the catwalks of the world and all these other young Aboriginal men and women are looking at her going, wow, there's another pathway for us. Here's something that we can get out and do. This makes them strong. So she travels around community teaching our young ones. It's not about the modelling, it's about being positive and, and being open to new opportunities. She's now got a little bubba, so a little bubba's out the back now uh, at this, this parade um, up in Sydney at um, Australian Fashion Week. And she's still this strong, beautiful, powerful woman, but now she's got a baby and she's still out there promoting Indigenous positivity, I call it. There's your healthy fishing or your healthy eating. Young one went out uh, just to the left or her right over to there. Big crocodile laying out on the beach called Nike. Big crocodile called Nike just laying on the beach. She just went in, she got herself some coral trout and she come out, she opened it up. We cooked it on the, on the um, open fire that night. It was just so much of a powerful photo because the young ones are still being taught to eat off the land, to eat healthy. And incredible, incredible family. As many of us know, unfortunately out in our communities, the, you know, in particular diabetes is rife. I work with an organisation called the Purple House out of Central Desert. I've been working with them for a long time you know, through you know, photos and videos and, and um, using you know, social media to show what's happening in our community. And old auntie here, we were just getting some photos and um, was talking about, unfortunately, she lost one of her limbs. And now we're working with, see the wheels on the wheelchair there? They're now developing new technology so the old traditional wheelchairs don't work out there. They don't do the, the four-wheel driving on the dirt and the sand. So now technology is coming together with, with science and medicine to create better opportunities that now people with, with disabilities can um, move around a lot easier. Another powerful photo to show that you know, culture and technology go so well hand in hand. And I, I, this photo, I know, it, it, it always makes me laugh because this young woman, she is just one of the most vibrant young Aboriginal women you will ever meet. And my mate here, you can see you know, the, the little wireless mic in the back and she's got the bionic legs and we call her the $6 billion dollar woman. And she laughs at it because she's so positive and powerful about who she is and all the kids come up and ask her about it. And there's no shame. They just innocently want to know about what it, what it is, what it's like. And she dances, she dances ceremony with the bionic legs. This is probably, like I said, 35 years, probably five or six million images. One of my most 
important photos, not so much for the photo itself, but for the story behind the photo. Who remembers the apology? Who remembers where they were on the, on the apology? Yeah, a fair few of you. Again, I was fortunate enough to document the apology, be the photographer for it. And you know, we went into the chambers, you know, all the politicians, all the prime ministers, everybody you know, did the apology. Rudd got up, did this beautiful ceremony. They all come out into the Great Hall. They all got up. Aunty Matilda was there. They were all talking to the crowd. They left. They come down. There's a woman called Tanya Hosh. Tanya Hosh now is, is one of the most senior women in the AFL. And that's her daughter, Marley. And she was there. Marley was kicking up a storm. She was cranky as. Dr. Marika here was sitting where the PM had sat. She sat down on the chair. She nodded at um, little one and put her in her arms. She went straight to sleep. Just like that. Just dropped off straight to sleep. I turned around because all the rest of the media pack were heading that way. I looked around. I just gave her a little nod took one photo of this, this beautiful, beautiful photo because Dr. Marika basically was senior in the reconciliation movement to get the apology for us, an incredibly powerful young woman. What had happened is after, there, about a year later, I was commissioned to do an exhibition up at Parliament House here in Canberra on the apology. We started to develop up all the collateral, the posters, the, the exhibition, the main one was going to be this. So we flew to Darwin to meet with her to work through it all, to make sure that we had the right permissions, the right acknowledgement, to make sure that everything was culturally right. We got into Darwin. She was never late. She never, never turned up. And we were left, you know, an hour, two hours later, we're wondering what had happened. We rang back to Yakala, and they said, no, she's actually flown back, um, a special flight back to, um, back to Homelands, and she passed away. She knew that she was dying, so she passed away. And unfortunately, what had happened is someone had pushed go on the printing of the show and the exhibitions. And we were, you know, a senior person passing away. It was very difficult because we were sitting there going, what are we going to do? So we, we went back to the community a little while later and had a yarn to them. And fortunately, all the clan groups and the community and their family agreed that the photo could be used for the showcase of the importance of what the apology was. What we did is then took the photo and the exhibition after it, and the funny thing is after it was in Parliament House, I've probably got a photo too quick, so forgive me, I'm just going to go back to something. We put the, this exhibition you see around there in Parliament House. We had all the ministers come through, we had all the public come through. I put a little book there. And everyone wrote these wonderful things, where they were, what it meant, what it meant to be an Australian, what it meant to recognise Indigenous people in this country. And I had the, I think he's called the Master at Arms, who's in charge of, I, I forget, he, he was quite senior in there. So if anyone knows, tell me. And he rang me and he says, listen, Wayne, we've got this beautiful book. We, we're reading all the wonderful comments, but we've got one in there. We, we'd actually like to either delete it or take the page out. I said, why, what happened? I said, um, someone's wrote in here, and I can't use the expletives, but all you black seas need to get out of our country. And we were a bit bewildered first up that someone had actually written that in there. They said, should we remove it? I said, no, actually, I'll have a yarn to some people, but we agreed to leave it in there. Because if this person was so, they'd seen the show, they went through the show, but they still had that, that racial negativity towards Indigenous people, that they sat down and wrote that. So as we all know, racism is still rife. But the importance is that these shows, these exhibitions, these visuals that we're now putting out to, uh, to, about to all schools is hopefully changing people's perceptions. So we took this show, we took it from the Parliament House up into Arnhem Land, we hung it basically out in the bush, and this is her family that come along to see it. And normally... That's not something that happens for many, many years. But again, we got permission to, to bring the show out and this is them. The, the beautiful story behind it is we had volunteers looking after the show and this is all behind Perspex. And what happened, the volunteers come and said, Wayne, um, we, we need to clean the artwork. I said, why is that? They said, oh, all the community are coming up and then it's getting all dirty. I said, oh, what do you mean? Because in traditional... Their, their traditional culture, the Yongu's culture, 
is to wipe under your arms, wipe your brow and touch either the effigy or something connected to the person that's passed away. And naturally enough, with all the red dust, the bauxite, after a while you actually couldn't start to see the photo. But we left it as that and it's never been cleaned or touched since. Uncle Archie Roach. How many of you have heard of Uncle Archie? Wow. Yeah. I knew Archie when he was a young fella coming through the streets in St Kilda. Yeah, too long ago. Don't worry about how old I am anymore. Very good friend. I've photographed him a million times. I've got, I could put up a whole show of just him and the importance that he had to our communities. But the beautiful thing about this, and this is the love and the the outpouring of love and the sharing of knowledge with young Isaiah Firebrace, who's another beautiful young Aboriginal singer. I had to bring this photo and show the importance of connecting and, and sharing of knowledge and stories. And just as the, um, this is Mao Pau, which is a Torres Strait Island man, incredibly powerful singer, at our recent National NAIDOC Ball, Uncle Archie was, they'd recorded him earlier and he was up on the screen and Mao Pau was there just after he passed away. Got to go cuteness. Got to go cuteness in a photo because these kids, they, um, again, this is out in remote communities up in the Northern Territory and I get to work with them so often and we, got, we see so many negative photos of our kids. I don't do negative, I always do positive. Well, not always, but the majority because I want to show the beautiful Beautiful kids, the beautiful evolution of culture and where it's heading now. So I'm like, what do you reckon, Norman? I'm like, how am I going for time, brother? Five. Any, you got any, any questions while we're heading along? I'm like, you might have gone all quiet on me. Jeez. Okay, I'll show you some more photos then. It's like a slideshow. Young ones I was working with up just, that was the gig I was on, is when I was telling you about those men at the, the Indigenous airport. This is the show, the, this is the photo shoot I was on with an international photographer um, going out, basically developing a series of photos that we travelled the world with and showing that you know, these are modern, young Aboriginal kids but still healthy, happy, connected to country, sharing their knowledge and their spirit and that's why I developed this photo to, to represent the ancestors, to represent their, their, their connection from generations. This one always makes me laugh. Anyone heard of the Festival of Pacific Arts? No, it's a festival that happens every four years. All the indigenous nations from around the Pacific all come together. Solomons, Guam, Fiji, different areas. This one here was in um, Guam. And what had happened is these, these ships on either side are called Varkas and they basically travelled from Hawaii right around all the islands collecting basically sort of message sticks to bring them to Guam. And then a lot of our Indigenous peoples bought their own vessels. So this year, the Badu mob used to use logs to travel the waterways. And it was one of the biggest logistical nightmares you could ever imagine, is because trying to get Uncle out here, sitting on there paddling this thing while the waves were coming in and these ships were going past him, it was, it was incredibly funny but also incredibly moving because as you come into the shore, all the different tribes from the Samoan and the Maori and uh, from Fiji and all were doing their traditional welcome to country ceremonies on the beach while all this mob were coming in. It's if you ever, ever get the opportunity to go to the Festival Pacific Arts, it is one of the most incredible two weeks of your life. The next one is in Hawaii. It was meant to be next year, but I think they've put it back a year. Our transgender population with Indigenous culture is just vibrant. It's powerful, it's beautiful. I work with this mob so much. And I wanted to bring this photo in is because I work with a... I did a show many years ago for the United Nations. I took it to Geneva, New York. They commissioned me, the UN commissioned me to do a series of photos on Indigenous women and their lives. And I was put together a brief I had to travel around the country, photograph and record all their stories and bring it together and take these shows to the, you know, like I said, New York and Geneva. 
what was missing is that I said to them when we went back onto the show, when we went back and delivered, I said, listen, we've got all these incredible women from, from Tasmania to the Tiwi, the Torres Strait. We don't have our transgender population in there. And unfortunately, the governing committee of the UN at that particular time didn't recognise. So they said, no, we have to pull the photos out. It can only be women. So we actually dug our heels in and we said, no, this show won't go ahead unless there's true representation. And fortunately enough, the show went ahead and I'll never forget it because this amazing ambassador from Trinidad came up to me. She was six foot six. She had this beautiful red headdress, this massive red dress, and she hugged me. And I don't mean hug me, she bear hugged me to death. And she says, this is so incredible that there's equal representation in your shows that we want you to come to our country and help work with our people to develop these, these images and these, these exhibitions. And here's an, well, this photo didn't go in that show, but this shows in my book, Culture's Life. Again, I want to show the diversity of our, this is at a festival in Sydney called the Yarbin Festival. And you know, the powerful and the energy out there and the representation is just, it's embracing. I don't know why I kept looking back here because I just realised I got it down here too. First ever Aboriginal Surf Life Saving Club up in um, Arnhem Land again on Ski Beach. And this photo just continually makes me laugh because we went out there, they've got the paddle boards, they've got the surfboards, they've got the whole thing, and the water was like glass. <laughs> and I'm saying, how am I going to photograph this? How am I going to truly represent a surf life saving club where there's no surf? And I have said to this one, does it ever, anyway, oh, yeah, probably this big. <laughs> but the fun and the joy that these kids go out and learn, you know, they all know, they're all like fishes, how they swim. But after that, we got them and we then took them down to the icebergers down at Bondi Beach. And it was one of the funniest things you'll ever see, these kids, the joy that they had working with professional lifesavers. Extraordinary. Dance. Okay, who's been to a Bangara performance? Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, I love this mob. They're, they're, I've been working with Stephen, who directs it for, for, a, for a very long time. And dance in our communities, not only you know, from, the, from the, you know, the upper echelons of Bangara, but right down to our, our communities, or right across our communities, is so important. You know, for the health and well-being, is, you know, it's a continuance of culture. Dance is um, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to join us. I might... When I said I don't do negative photos, this is a point of view, point of view photo, I call this. This is up in Tennant Creek, a small community outside of Tennant Creek. The artists there are, are known worldwide. They're incredible. They're, it's a men's shed. Basically, all the men go into paint. The women don't paint in there. And what they do is they actually... Well, all your car batteries come in pallets, and under the pallets come this melamine stuff. Um, and what they do is they take all the batteries and once they've all been used, they take this stuff and then they paint their art on it. These artworks sell for twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. But this is the conditions that the artists still live in. And like I said, I don't like to bring too much negativity, but I like to bring reality and a perspective. This mob, there's three men that live in this house with no running water, no toilets, no doors, no windows, uh, open to the elements. But there's still... Joy and happiness is when they paint, when they can get back and they go out on country and do their art. So some people will see a negative photo. I see the stories that were shared with me on culture. What do you reckon, Norman? A couple more. Festival Pacific Arts. Again, from a negative to an extreme happy because... I love to travel the world, so I leave here tonight, I'll fly to Sydney tomorrow to, to shoot for, and this is important if you, if you could all share this, I'm working with um, a mob called um, 1300 Yarn, which is part of Lifeline. It's basically for our communities, if they have something that they need to chat about, if they're in a position where they're not comfortable talking to a non-Indigenous person, they can now ring 1300 Yarn and they can talk to other Aboriginal people about what's happening. So if, if any of you can put this message out, it will be really important. So I'm doing a photo shoot tomorrow to basically build the collateral to show people that they can call in. 
I just went off on a tangent again, didn't I? Huh? <laughs> so I do that tomorrow and then I jump on a plane for Alaska on Monday morning and we're working with the, the mob up in Alaska, then we head down to Nevada, uh, Mississippi, about four different states about the importance of cross-cultural discussion. So I'm actually making this small doco um, which will be a part of the Supply Nation thing, which I'll share, share online. And just keep an eye out for Wayne Quillam, you'll start to see all the, all the photos coming out. Dance. And I've, I've probably got, I reckon, rather, I reckon I've probably got about another 50 photos there that I could talk all day about. And, and, and I love every story. So my question to yeah. you is, I mean, it's an amazing portfolio with incredible images. What's the one project you wish you could do, but you've just not got to yet? Oh, I'm about to do it. <laughs> but, and that's, that's a really interesting question. I, I've just been commissioned to do a project where I travel around to 12 different countries. On, um, and, and it's basically, there's 12 major weather stations around the world where scientists are basically working on climate change. They're, they're, they give us you know, all the future forecasting. It's, it's incredible what these guys are doing out there. And what's happening is, as technology is beginning to take over human interaction, is they're all digitising these weather stations. And what's all, so these scientists are actually working with the Indigenous people on the ground. So whether it's our mob out in Western Australia where they've got a satellite station out there, they consult with the local mob. So my job is I'm going to film all these tours. So we do Antarctica, we do Central America, uh, the oh, yeah, 12 different countries. It's got to be called Climate Keepers. Uh, so this is the passion project I'd be waiting for to go out and film and photograph to bring this show together, which it hasn't been commissioned by one of the streaming agencies, but it looks like it's about to happen. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Wayne for a fantastic... Okay. Music stuff. Oh, thank yeah. you. Really appreciate it. And that are really two incredible talks that will remain with us for a long time to come, and that's just the way it should be in the closing plenary of a, of a conference such as this. Can we have lights up? Because we're now going to um, draw the uh, prizes, and Rachel Killorn is going to help me here. Could you please, Rachel is one of the key people in, turn, in the back room making this conference possible. And, 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 and clapping and uh, acknowledging Rachel is to acknowledge the huge work, work of the staff here that have made this possible. <laughs> Come on up. Bring the pots. What's the, what's the first one? The first pot we have is the Ultimate Heart Sport Prize. The Ultimate Heart Sport Prize. OK, OK, OK. And the winner is Angela Stratton. Is there anything in the bag? <laughs> the next prize is what? So the RMA 23 President's Breakfast Prize for next year. So you're going to have to come next year. You know, you know, yeah. Might cost your fortune to get there, but you can really go to the breakfast. All right, let's go. And the prize is going to Sana Ahmed. Sana Oran. We'll pass it on to Sana. Next one is what? The next one is the... Conference Awards dinner at RMA 23. The Conference Awards dinner ticket. This is a really, this is a definite one to be going mm -hmm. for. And the winner here is Marion Dover. <laughs> Isn't it embarrassing how it exposes people who have skived <laughs> off already? But we will make sure they find they get things. Uh, the next prize is a $300 Acrom voucher to put towards a course. Great. And the winner here is Davina Oates. Are we, are we taking notes of this? Yes. Who's won what? Totally. Totally? We're recording we're, this we're one. Okay, good. And <laughs> I was telling before, I once did a draw, some fancy dinner or other, and our lunch it was, and um, this, this jeweler in the eastern suburbs of Sydney donated a really expensive necklace. 
and they double sold the tickets and two people won it. <laughs> Wasn't good. <laughs> this is much safer. And this is the RMA 23 full conference sure. delegate ticket. It's highly competitive and Ian Murphy has won this one. <laughs> and that concludes the draw. And now for the RMA 23 reveal and farewells, and I invite Megan Bellow and Daniel Hall Dan Halliday to come up to the stage. Welcome everyone to uh, the final session of today, uh, apart yep. from those staying around for the fellowship um, further on. Um, it's been a remarkable few days. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for um, the, uh, the contribution, uh, their feedback, um, their support uh, and the engagement that we've had um, over, this short period, over this period of time. Um, it's given me a lot of insight into to what I'm going to be facing, I think, in the next couple of years ahead. I um, really appreciate everyone's uh, contribution in terms of their, their thoughts about how um, you know, they can uh, they work with, with me, with Akram, uh, and, uh, and noting that there's a lot of potential collaborations which I'm sure are going to bear fruit into the future. So I'm really, really positive about that. Yeah, thank you. It's been an amazing conference and I really hope that everyone's had time to reconnect, recharge and um, to go back to your communities and do the amazing work that you all do. So thank you so much for coming. So this isn't a particularly long uh, sort of session. It's a, you know, um, there's only going to be a, a short uh, farewell because no doubt we'll be all seeing you very shortly. I'd just like to make note of my thanks uh, to, uh, to all delegates um, to, um, to all people that could travel from uh, you know, far and wide, um, to, um, to all of, of those uh, you know, hard workers, um, the, uh, the staff of Akram, RDA, uh, and, uh, and all the people, of course, that, uh, that can't be here uh, today as well. Um, but numerous um, and many um, that contribute to Akram uh, and, of course, RDA, and, and again, my acknowledgement um, you know, of um, immediate past president uh, Sarah Chalmers um, and all the tireless work of people that were stepping down from their current positions and, and going into the new positions going forward. We've got a, a lot of work ahead of us, but I'm really looking forward to it. I think uh, we might uh, move on to the uh, reveal of where we're going next year. Hobart. So um, yeah, I think I've not got, well, I should have my tickets already booked. Oh, I hope. I'm so much looking forward to this. I think Tassie's an awesome place. And uh, yeah, if there's only place you can come second to Stanthorpe, Tassie's going to be you know, close to that. So. <laughs> yeah, we hope that we can see you all uh, next year at Hobart. Uh, make sure you take note of the uh, dates. And uh, it is a pre-conference to Wonka next year. So we're hoping um, for a really good show. And uh, yeah, hope to see you there. Well, you can't go home just yet because there's the fellowship ceremony to come at four o'clock. Um, and for the new fellows um, who are at the ceremony, you need to be robed. Um, and to be robed, you should go now to the wellness centre and you will be robed there. For family and friends, you can hang around here, hang in the foyer, wherever you like, for a 4 p.m. start. It's been a pleasure to MC for you this year and um, go safely. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.